MK on the ground in South Florida. I've been, I don't know if people notice, we're getting a little better dad shape lately, but I want to take it to the next level. I want to get strong. Daru, strong. Hopping the feet, I'm with the dogs, we popping the leash. Ragging a ball and a talking is cheap. Can't entertain what I got from the streets. More extension, more extension, yeah. Well, it's instability too. Yeah. All right, what's going on guys? My name is Phil DeRue. We are here about to shoot room service diaries and I'm gonna go ahead and send Brian and Luke through a DeRue Strong training session. I know Brian is a funny guy, so we're gonna go ahead and see how funny he's gonna be when he pushes his prowler. Maybe he will throw up, maybe he won't. We'll see what happens. Now Luke, on the other hand, I know he can push some weight, so I'm gonna go ahead and see how well he does in my territory. Are you guys into ass tats too? He also said, listen, no, but... Yeah, see, I knew, I knew I liked this guy. Oh, no, what 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 I've never had somebody show me their dad's ass before. This, this excitedly. Holy shit! Holy shit. Well, that's like the one on the back of your head. Precisely, like Mandala style. Okay, yeah, yeah. You know, we don't always talk to trainers on this show, but when they're as esteemed and good and as well, let's say accomplished as our next guest. Badass, How about badass too? We decide to do it all the way from Deerfield Beach, Florida. It is the trainer to the stars. It's Phil DeRue. Hi, Phil. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, well, first Appreciate of all, it. I have to do this on camera. I have to apologize to Phil. <laughs> we were supposed to shoot this two hours ago. I went to the wrong airport. I am so sorry, Phil. I did this to everyone. It's my fault, bro. Well, this I'm is what sorry. happens when you go to Florida, man. Things start to get crazy. I don't obviously. think I'm the only person to do this, though. Oh, I feel yeah. like it's happened before to it's other people. It's definitely happened. And, and what I'm seeing is an influx of people just migrating over to Florida. So then you have the traffic on top of that. So you're all good. You're my man, so I'm, I, I'm no problem. In, in honor of Phil, I tried to dress like random Florida man today for this. And, uh, you know, I think I, I think I pulled it off well. You know? Phil, I, I think a lot of people don't necessarily know. Some people know who you are. Some people don't. Let's, let's set the table for folks who don't. You are a trainer to a lot of MMA stars. Dustin Poirier. You've had a lot of guys in your stable before. Arlovsky. Many other ones. You want a champion? You want a champion? What would you say that, uh, describe yourself to the folks. So how do you view yourself and what you do? A performance coach, you know, primarily. I'm a teacher. I work with several now at this point 5,000 coaches that I mentor around the world so that's really where I go now is more so coaching coaches but I still have my staple of fighters that I work with I've been doing that for 14 years now I've been training and competing in martial arts for roughly eight or nine years I was a pro at one point uh, with Dean Thomas so uh, he old started school. me out old school yeah yeah uh, I was 19 20 years old after I got out of college playing football and um, he played at a historically black college. Yeah, we were wondering. BC wants Mike, to know: Are you black? <laughs> Mike Perry was his <laughs> roommate. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Funny you said that. But uh, but uh, so Mike actually was a part of Dean's actually affiliate school. So we used to cross train a lot. So I know Mike I for love a long Mike time. Perry, yeah. yeah, he's a good dude. Um, but yeah, but so you played at Alabama State. You were Alabama a defensive State, back, right? Defensive back. Played strong safety, and then you know when I was in high school, played you know middle linebacker. Okay, so you were the hitter. Yeah, that's, I mean, that was primarily why I stopped fighting because of the fact that the concussions just built up on me. All right, so I, let's, let's rewind the tape. Where did you grow up? Here, Deerfield Beach, Florida, Broward County primarily, up and down Fort Lauderdale area. But I decided to put the gym here because I wanted to give back to the community. This is something that I've always wanted to do at some point, and the brand built enough to where now I can fully do that. And I have my other gym. I live about an hour and a half away, so I have that gym up there. But I wanted to make this spot special for the kids in the community. Give them somewhere that they can go that is positive. Because let's face it, we don't live in the greatest area, right? So what I want to do is get back, give them an opportunity to be around positive individuals. Not only do we have fighters in here, professional athletes, but we have celebrities too as well. You know, we have great human beings just in general. So I wanted to give them a spot to where they could come to to have that. All right, so let's get back to Dean if we can. Sure. How did you win him over? Did you win him over? Like you, the journey through MMA, because it wasn't a long journey in MMA. It's, you've been in the MMA sport uh, in various roles, but as a fighter, it wasn't a super long one. No, no, eight years primarily. Okay. Like it seemed longer because I was in it. You know, I was in it for two, three days, or through two, three times a day for six, seven days a week. 
And so with Dean, I think it was more so he wanted to make sure that I was really, truly into it, you know, because he started when it wasn't like the cool thing to do. Right. He, he was, you know, finding wrestlers in high school. He was cutting their hair and, you know, bartering with them to, to teach them how to wrestle. Hmm. You know, these are the, those times. What now is like everybody wanted to fight at that point. You know, the Ultimate Fighter came out. So he was really with all of us. We had five guys, five professionals, amateur tooth professional um, that he brought up with him. And so we would always we were always looking to, you know, showcase ourselves and make sure that we won him over, per se. Uh, he was one of those hard asses that like, you know, it was going to be a hard way to to get him to like really follow what we were doing. You know, and I remember my first amateur fight I won. And I called him. He wasn't even there. This was in uh, Cut Off, Louisiana. It was like population a thousand, maybe. Right, I don't know. Right. And I won the fight. And I called him. And I'm like super excited. And I go, Dean, man, I won. I did great. He's like, cool. When are you coming back to the gym? <laughs> didn't even. Say, I'm like, he didn't even say like good. I don't even think he said cool. I said, when are you coming back to the gym? I think that's the only thing he said. And I go, uh, Monday, I guess, man. Like, I hung up, and that was it. And that was that's Dean. You know, I think now he's stated this uh, recently that. He's seen my progression. He's seen the growth uh, from when I was a young kid coming to him, you know, rough around the edges to now. So, and I remember the day that I talked to him after I, reti I actually retired based on what he told me because I would have kept trying to go for it. Did he give you like a Robin Deshaub, Rogan Deshaub type speech to talk think, you off? I think so. I think so. It was primarily like, listen, if this was your, your knee or your elbow or your arm or something like you could work around it, but it's your, it's your brain. You can't really work around that. So, you know, after he told me that, and that's when I decided to just call it quits in a sense and pivot, you know, but two years later, a year and a half later, I wanted to get back into the sport heavily. And so he was down at ATT and I know he was coaching full time. Now we had left, he had left the gym that I started with and there was really no other MMA gym per se like that. So when he went down, I was like, all right, well, I want to get back into the sport, but I just don't know. I want, I want to, you know, try to get there. What can I do? Or if you have any openings for somebody that you're working with, because I know he's still working with Tyron. I knew that he was down there. So like, maybe there's something there. And he's like, you know what? You may be in luck, come down, bring your resume, you know, see what you can do. And so the first day I trained King Mola Wall, Tisha Torres, Dustin and Daya Davis. Hmm. And that was the first day. So I was like, okay, throw me to the, to the wolves, I guess. But at that time, I had already developed a, a great coaching skill at that point. I've already built my gym up. Um, we were at that 11,000 square feet. You know, I've had like 300 members. And I was like, you know what, let's, uh, let's see what I can do. Because I wanted to still work with fighters. I still wanted to work with those competitors. And I wanted to be a part of it now. I still wanted to be there at some capacity. I got questions though. What type of fighter was Phil DeRue? I was an athlete. You know, primarily, I, I mean, at the you, end had, of the day, you had high school wrestling experience. Yeah. Yeah. I wrestled. I think I think more so I was I was I was great at I was more enticed with the stand up game. Primarily, I wanted to stand up and fight and all that. But I would just take it to where I knew that my opponent didn't have. You know, that was the main thing was like I was looking to game plan. And so that's when I found out that I would be a better coach than an actual fighter. Sure. Because the game plan, the strategy, the tactics, you know, really resonated with me. Did you have a shitty nickname? Please tell me. It was Bam Bam. Oh, oh Bam Bam. That's not bad. That's pretty good, that's actually. That's all right. I mean, that, that, that's very specific, though. Yeah. You got to look the part. And that and that primarily was from me as a younger kid because I was just hitting everything when I was a kid. So I was like, oh, I, that was the nickname y'all gave me? Okay, I'll just take that then, you know. <laughs> yeah. But it went through several different phases, you know. When did it dawn on you where you were like, I'm actually a pretty good coach. Like, I can do yeah. something with this, you know? I knew I was a good trainer. I knew I was a good motivator uh, when I was a kid because... I started really training people, my friends at like 16, you know, I would bring guys over to the, to the, to the gym or I would bring them to my, I had this, um, I had this makeshift bench that was like wobbly, but I would put together programs and I was reading Louis stuff and I was reading Joe DeFranco. And so I already knew how to like properly program and periodize at a young age. When I started to realize that I could coach at a high level was when I got to top team. Because I knew that the methods and the systems and the protocols that I was using was actually working at a high level. And then I could relay and communicate properly to these people that take it to the next level on that way. Then I was like, okay, I got something here. Hmm. Right. Uh, on the, excuse me, on the split between what you actually do, obviously so much of it is scientific and, and involves the, the body and, and nutrition and all that combining together. 
But how important is the psychological side in the success you've had? Do you think that that has allowed you to kind of start to separate your name from the others in this game? It's very big in the fight game. It's very big in, in just sport in general. You know, that was something that I needed to learn more of. I needed to learn how to properly communicate and understand personality traits and go to a point where I can test them and actually assess, you know, who they are as an individual. So then I can go ahead and relay over information that is going to get us the adaptation necessary. But you, sometimes you gotta, you gotta get in that ass, so to speak. Absolutely. Here's the thing, it's funny, some, some guys don't like that, right? So some yeah, guys, not everyone responds to no, that hard ass shit. Some guys don't like that. And I thought that going into that situation, because at this point I was training high school kids and some, some general pop clients, and I had some college football players that liked that style, right? King Mo Wall liked that style. Dustin Poirier did not like that style, right? <laughs> so like, I remember, I guess he told Daya, he's like, man, why is this guy yelling at us? <laughs> and I was like, oh, this, this doesn't work for him, you know? At certain times, you know, and especially when you develop a trust and a bond with that individual, yeah, you can do that, but you have to find pain points. You have to peel back the layers on their actual why, and then, then you can relay over certain things and say certain things to get them to be motivated. Because listen, at the end of the day, elite fighters at the UFC level, they are already self-motivated. It's just getting that one or two things out of them to really figure out, okay, I need to push it a little bit more because in a controlled environment with prowlers and squat racks and things like that, they're not used to that in, in, a, in all essence. Like most of the fighters very new to the weight room. So pushing them in this world is a little bit different. Whereas that they know if they don't push it in sparring or they don't push it in their drills, they may not make it out of the cage alive, right? So it's really different in that, in that perspective. So I have to give them a reframing. I have to make them understand that what we do in here will have some transfer over to what they do over there. And when that happens, then you get buy-in. When did you go independent? I went independent. Well, I was, you I was always it. independent. Okay, okay. Um, but, but like, you know, fully independent, I guess. So I started at 22, right? Opened up my own gym, 22 years old. And then when I went to top team, that was the first time I ever actually got a paycheck. I, I've never really gotten a pay job, so I was I was working on the team, and I was there for four and a half years, um, building up, you know, my base, and then understanding, you know, how to actually train these types of people um, at that level, and then when I it was around actually in COVID, I left at two. 2020. 2020. That's right. And then you do, and you've had this facility how long? I had this. I actually moved in here maybe four or five months ago. Oh, okay, so this is all relatively this new. This is new, yeah. And I had a gym um, in Boca Raton with, uh, with Mo Vaughn for a little bit. And that was really my, my way out. Like I got out of top team and went over there primarily and just started working and building up, you know, more of a base of like overall clients. So now I have boxers, judokas, everybody. So Mo Vaughn was the 95 AL MVP. Wanted to remind you of that. Yeah, thanks. I don't watch baseball, but I do know who Mo Vaughn is. You were big into like mathletes, though. Yeah, I was a mathlete. That's true. Uh, all right, so let's talk about Dustin Poirier. How did you end up like? It seems like of all the relationships you have, and maybe I don't, I don't know this, but it just seems from afar anyway that that is one of your closer ones for sure. Is that a fair characterization? And if so, how did it get here? Uh, well, so I think that. Similar personalities. Similar backgrounds in similar a way too, man. Similar backgrounds. I fought a lot in Louisiana actually too as well. I fought some of his teammates. Um, I remember, you know, he was in, I think he was in the crowd at one point in my pro debut hmm. against Kurt Hollibaugh. Who fought in Bellator or Strike Force, I believe? He fought in Strike Force and the UFC. Possibly? No, he definitely fought in Strike Force. He fought in the UFC twice. Uh, twice, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, his big name, or in that, in Louisiana, his yeah. big name. We were the main event, too, as well, my, my pro debut. Um, yeah, it was crazy. And I made $200, by the way. Hey, <laughs> at least you I made it. Shit. I, I made that and spent that yeah. shit. Don't worry about <laughs> So, um, but yeah, I mean, with that, it was... It was that kind of chemistry, you know. Um, I was there, the first time I went there as a coach, I used to train, I used to cross train as a, as a fighter. But the first time I went there as a coach, we sat and we talked for at least an hour and a half. And I remember him just being so welcoming and just the person who he is, you know, you know he's a, he's a stand-up guy. So I, I like that about hero. him. And I say that very sparingly about fighters. Randy Couture, American hero, okay? Sure. Dustin Poirier, American hero. For sure. Yeah, I mean, and, and he likes to say I'm a student of the game, but he's a student of the game too as well. Like he loves boxing, he loves jiu-jitsu, he loves it all. And I think that that was something also that we bonded with. Like I wanted to be the best at what I did for him and he wanted to be the best at what he did for his family. So that's, that's where we grew. And then I remember, you know, uh, for the first year, he's a person that keeps a circle close, right? So I had to get into the circle before that happened. And 
we didn't start working together for another year and a half until he decided, you know, he's not a big strength and conditioning guy. You know, he's not, he's not somebody, somebody that would just go into the gym. Now he does because he likes to look the part, you know, he wants to build a little bit of muscle. He's getting bigger now too as well. But when I met him, he was still like at that 45, 155 right. range, you know, and uh, he just started to grow, you know, and, and that's just maturity overall. And that's where, like, I really started to grow with him because I started to understand him, who he was as a person. One of the first conversation we had was, was uh, really about uh, road work and how he loved to run. But you knew before that he had a, a bad hip issue, right? So he had a hip impingement. He had a constant problems. Yep. Very bad. And, like, at that point, he was not saying anything. So I was like, you'd run seven miles, but it, you'd be in excruciating pain afterward. And I said, why are we doing this? I was like, you can do other things to increase your aerobic capacity. And he was like, no, nah, I just like to do it. And I go, well, can we level? Like, can we figure something else out? He's like, no, nah, I'm not going <laughs> to. You know, it's just him. It's like working with Brian, really, if I could tell you. <laughs> He's like, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I, I mean, and I was like, okay, so do me this favor. When you run, run on a softer surface. Or when you do run, just manage your volume, you know, per se. And so we leveled with that. And he was cool with that. All right, the success, not necessarily because of you, but you played a big part in the larger Poirier team. You come to Dustin, I believe I was talking to you off camera, right after the loss to Michael Johnson, which kick-started a run for him. He's among the most battle-tested when, when you're talking about will, chin, durability, but you play a part in building that up. So, you know, how, what is that strategy and focus? Because you get a guy like that, he has to have the want and will, and he does. But he's built for 25 minutes of hell. Also, we should say, like, just for the record, for folks who may not remember that fight or haven't seen it, I would argue that's one of Dustin's worst losses mm -hmm. in the sense of relative to his ability, yeah. that was a major underperformance. Definitely. You definitely. Know? And he, since then, he's kicked it into high gear, obviously. He, he, he definitely should have won that fight. And if that ever got ran back, it, it would be different. Oh, I'd pick him to win. I thought he was going to win that fight, to be honest. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think he's just grown. Um, I mean, you've seen it from the first, even from the first uh, Conor fight to the second Conor fight, like, his mindset is totally different. And he doesn't allow outside distractions to come into his psyche and allow it, you know, to allow it to negatively affect his performance. You know, so with that, overall, I just wanted him to feel comfortable. And I wanted him to feel comfortable in the fact that he was going to get better no matter what we did in here because it was new to him. So he was going to get an adaptation no matter what. Right. I wanted to focus on things that he wasn't doing inside of the skills training. Why do fighters hate strength and conditioning? I think most of it is difficult. And then also for the most part, they don't see the correlation, right? They see it as another stressor, as, you know, more to be tired from, and they have so many things that they have to do. I understand that because, again, I fought, and I, I know, you know, the day-to-day -day process. But when you come in and it's directly correlated to whatever their game plan is or whatever their structured uh, dispositions are, right, whether, you know, they have some insufficiency, some you know, co some coordination issues, whatever the case. If I can get that better and they see that generate more positive adaptation inside the skills training, then they're more apt to actually coming in and doing the work. But that takes like several camps. It hey, does. You gotta build that trust. It, it takes does. time. I mean, that, that's an investment, like quite literally, like you have to put a dollar in the account, like kind of every day. I, I mean, it really didn't, in the case of Dustin, it didn't start until the second camp yeah. where then we started to implement certain things like cognitive conditioning and mobility work. And then he was like, I just want to blow out my lungs today. And then we started to do, you know, things like that for him because he, he, he started to trust the process. And that's the same with every fighter. Primarily I had Kevin Lee in here. Kevin Lee's never done any strength and conditioning that was structured. The first day I, I worked with I saw the video. Right. He was walking on his heels and doing like warm ups from like the littlest part of the muscle all the way to the big one. Well, he had just future champion Kevin Lee. We, we, I was like, we have been. You should know this about Kevin Lee and I, or uh -huh. us. We're, we we were and have been big believers in Kevin Lee. Truthers, if you will. Truthers. We get accused of being truthers because he has fallen on hard times. Although he has returned to the UFC, and so we'll see what happens there. He's got new management, and I know he converted to Islam and stuff. So it seems like his life is in order. And but he may have been a staff infection away from being the interim champion. He's always been yoked like. These dudes, you know what it is? It's the dudes who are naturally athletic, naturally strong, naturally fucking like that. They don't think twice about it. Whereas doofuses like us, we every rep matters. You know what I mean? True. Yeah, that, that's true. And I think that, you know, he took advantage of that in, in some capacity. But what I wanted to do was I wanted to show him that there was there was some dysfunction there. He tore his ACL yeah, we are. again for the, the second The same time. one or a different one? He tore both of them and then tore this one again wow. against uh, Diego. 
in in Fucking in Eagle, day. right? And I saw the video and I could see him and he, he kind of like yeah. he jolted and he lost his he footing. He couldn't move, yeah. No, so then he came to me and he didn't even know who I was, which was great. I was happy with it. He knew like he knew of me, but he didn't he didn't follow me or anything like that. So when he came into the gym, I was just and he was going to Sanford, so it was right across the street at that at that time. And um I go, "Listen, we're going to develop more structure. We got to get stronger in the surrounding areas. We need to build strength of the muscles that cross that joint. And you know, I tore my ACL. So yes. I know I battled back. I remember your rehab. Right. You documented every, every uh, stage of that. I wanted to so I could showcase, okay, this can be, this can be dealt with. We can definitely come back from it. And uh, so I, I did it with him. And then he started, he was like, man, I've never done anything like this. And that's good because now we get a positive adaptation. Sure. So every day would come back and come back and he would come, you know, he'd come three days, four days a week and he's never done any strength conditioning before this. I'm not going to say he's done no strength conditioning. He just hasn't had it structured. Right. So, yeah, he's been one guy. And then another guy that's fighting this weekend, Chase Sherman, who's been here consistently putting in the work. But he's a guy that's very intuitive. Like he loves to know what's going on. And that's where you find out who that person is, like personality wise. He's acetylcholine dominant. He's like very conscientious of what he wants to do and how he wants to do it and why he's doing it. And you have those types of individuals. Then you have those very A type dominant people that are just like, I don't care. Just tell me what I got to do and I'm just going to go do it. Then where does Joanna Champion fall into that mix? You know, because we we're allowed to have our favorite fighters. Luke won't stop talking about city kickboxers. All, I do like city kickboxing. All right, good fight. tell me about the dog that's inside Joanna. Jay is like is a different is a different animal. Like I first trained her on a Sunday afternoon. It was the first time that she started at top team, and she called me up and she was like, "Coach, I want to I want to train. Can you do Sunday?" I'm like, "Absolutely." She's like one of my favorite fighters. But I was like, "Absolutely." When she walked in the gym, I'm like, "I gotta train you," because I knew. She had that dog in her, like I saw it. And uh, the first time I, I had her run the prowler, you know, it was like an initiation phase. Can you describe the, the, what this the, prowler is? The prowler is the sled, right? Yeah, it's a sled, it's a push sled, you know. Um, it even has a warning on there that you could catch prowler flu, which basically means you might throw up, you know, uncontrollably. And, uh, and so I was like, all right, let's do that. You know, primarily it was more so just for muscular endurance work and everything else to break it down. But for the most part, I want to see where she was at mentally, you know, and mentally in that, in that way where she couldn't take advantage, she couldn't control the tempo, she couldn't, you know, she couldn't pace herself. And that's another reason why they don't like it, because I control the tempo, I control the pace. Right. So now it's gonna hurt, no matter what. And they're not really that great at that, in a lot of ways, and nobody really is. Right. You know, everybody wants to, to kind of to get through it, you know? And um, maybe sometimes it's not about getting through it. Maybe it's sometimes it is about just testing yourself. Sure. Right, creating that mental fortitude. So you, you talk about like personality in when people show up and what they say and what they prefer. But like I've detected your personality from afar. I mean, I've, I've known you for some time, but even then I could tell that like, they were a little bit different. So let me give you an example. Like um, your methods are what I would call a mix between old school wisdom and new school, uh, like I don't know, progressive ideas. It's this interesting mix between them. And I think you get that way because you're constantly um, investing in yourself, investing in your knowledge, investing in your, like, what do I need to know? So when you were coaching, when did you realize, okay, here's what I know is true, and also, shit, I need to know more. And what did you do to solve that problem? I would reach out to as many people that I respected as possible. I would look for mentors, you know, I would reach out to Louis. I would reach out to Joe DeFranco. I would reach out to anybody that I knew that was doing it on a high level. And then I would also heavy into the books, be all into, you know, super training, you know, uh, science of practice and strength training. Those are like my Bibles in a sense, right? My, my fitness and strength and conditioning Bibles. And so I would always do that. And then I have a long drive. Remember that. So I used that drive and I took it, you know, took advantage of that drive. So I'd call it like, it's 95, I-95, it's 95 University. <laughs> you know, so it was, and it was four years of that, two, three hours Shit a day. Shit adds up. Adds up. They don't use turn signals at that college at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Not over there. No, 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 no. No, we're running past things. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely. So, yeah, I would just, I would just spend time listening to podcasts, audio books, everything that I knew I needed to learn. I saw you at like, seminars a bunch too, right? Yeah, yeah. No, as, as far as me going to yeah, them, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Like seminars, workshops, anything I could get my hands on, 
Um, and going there was, was really good because I could network too as well. So, you know, FRC and, you know, even with the CPPS and everything else and CFSC with, with uh, Mike Boyle stuff. And I would find similarities, but I would also find differences. And I would pick the things that I knew that were going to work for me in my circumstances. I just rode with it. You know, it's weird though. I, I bring us all up to say, like, you came up at a time when, like, strength and conditioning, we talk about MMA being in the dark ages in 05 and 06, but, dude, strength and conditioning was even fucking worse. I'll never forget, dude, this is a true story. This is why I ask you about it. I remember I one time went to go interview Brandon Vera. This is before he went to Alliance. He was with Lloyd Irvin at the time in Camp Springs, Maryland, just outside D.C., so I was like, bet, let's go over there. And I show up, and he was very friendly. It was, he was doing, like, two or three days, so this was the evening session. This was right before the fight with Tim Sylvia. And uh, I remember they were like, oh, you should have seen the strength and conditioning class this morning. And I'm like, oh, yeah, what was it like? They had video of it. It was just Brandon Vera barfing in between, like, they would be like exhaustion barfing. And they'd be like, okay, 25 more laps. I'd be like, what the fuck is this? Right? We have come a long way from that, it feels like. And it feels like on the MMA side, for me, you were one of the first ones who was, like, trying to be scientific with it. Well, he's still got the sled flu, so he's got okay, the okay. school touch. Okay, There's right? always going to be a place for that in when you push yourself to the yeah. limit, but it, but they would seek that out, right? Yeah. Rabdo the Clown and CrossFit, yeah. all that shit. Well, here's the thing, and, and let, me, let me just say this, like, I would never really do that unless it was for a specific reason, whether that be... Fuck this guy. Yeah, or that, <laughs> yeah, right? Or, like, I wanted to see, or I would test them. It's an assessment process. So how much sprint work can we do in an extended amount of time? How much can we recover from within a certain amount of time? Because now I can use field-based activities as, as opposed to going to, you know, a UFC PI, and they, they, weren't, they weren't even around at that time. Or, like, another lab testing where VO2 max and lactate threshold, I can give this a go and actually have that as a baseline assessment and then re reassess them afterwards. So I would push them right into the edge and then I pull them back. Right. And then I remember this was when I was fighting too, is like five by five minute rounds, circuit training, do it one minute each and go until you die. And that was like the main thing and everybody did it, you know? And so I decided, okay, what are they not getting that? What are they not getting? outside of the actual skills training. They're not getting maximal power output. They're not increasing their explosive power as a whole because they're not giving the adequate amount of rest periods. And they're also not doing low intensity cardio. They may be doing road work, but they're pushing into lactic zones because they're competitive and they want to push themselves mentally. So then I'm like, all right, we got to go from a high low approach. So I got to give, I got to ramp up their alactic system and I got to ramp up their aerobic system. And that way I can give these two systems here and bring them together when they do their skills training, which is primarily somewhere in that lactic zone. He's an artist. Yeah, Dude, you can, tell, you can this is what I'm saying. Like I've seen the development of all this. When did we cross paths? When did I hit you up? Because uh, I remember I did a story on you for MMA fighting. I think that was it. I think that was it. And then I seen you in Dallas. Yes. And then that's when we talked. Yes. And um, that was when Dustin got the eye poked. From, from Eddie, Eddie, yeah, that was uh, oh fuck, that, that was, was right. two eleven, right? Yeah, that's right. It was Stepe was on that car. Joanna was on, Joanna the car. Was on that car. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. That was my first. Ozzy that was my off. first. That was my first uh, UFC event that I went to. Actually, is that right? Well, the reason why I bring that up is because I did a story on on Phil for MMA fighting because I was looking up coaches who were trying to do different things, and uh, you were the. Uh, this is true. I'm not saying you were the first guy to do this. But you were the first guy that I saw making guys do zercher squats for takedown defense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then I, saw, I looked him up and I'm like, I had seen he had done bodybuilding. He had fought MMA. He'd been a football player at a collegiate level. And uh, powerlifting. Powerlifting. And I had seen you powerlifting. I was like, so this dude probably knows a shit ton. Yeah. And sure enough, the journey just kept going from there. Yeah, I mean, and, and then like, I've, I've always figured out what was the weakest issue because I had so many to work with. You know, so like, you had like 60 plus fighters at the high level coming to you on a weekly basis. So then I knew what I needed to do. And then when I saw the, I saw like, a, there was a general issue that was going on where I was like, their mobility sucks or their lack of coordination in certain movements are not good because they're so specific. So like even running was an issue, like watching their gait was a problem. And a lot of jujitsu guys that come from that jujitsu background, like tight hips, you know, tight upper back, right. you know, sure. so or tight low back and, and kyphotic posture. And that that'll affect your movement. Right. So I wanted them to be better movers because I knew if they were better movers, they could correlate that over in a skills perspective. Dude, I, re I remember distinctly, distinctly. What year was this? 
2010, something like that. Mm -hmm. Marcelo Garcia doing an interview being like, yeah, there was someone's like, what do you do for strength and conditioning? He goes, more jujitsu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, well, if it works for Marcelo, that must be great. And now I'm like, okay, maybe it did work for, I mean, Marcelo had a great career, but like, it's fucking insane that people kind of think that shit. It's crazy. I, I mean, I had a conversation with Andre Durrell, and it was actually one of the most viral videos I had. I've seen it. Yeah, yeah. We talked about the value of like why weightlifting for punching, or sorry, for uh, it boxing. Was just boxing in we general. We called this comeback win. We did. Phil we did call us. Come, we yeah. called this comeback win. Yeah, yes. that was amazing, man. I was. He I looked was fucking super, dope. I was so excited for him, man. He's a guy that really put in the work and then like is is a student. He wanted to learn what was going and on. He's grateful to be here too. Like, oh, he absolutely. hasn't lost that. Super like, grateful. Like this is another great opportunity. Yeah, he called you. me like he was a like a fan. I was like, bro, I'm a fan. Like, what are we doing? Like, so I, I was more so just just happy to help him in that in that in that way. So I wanted to make sure that he had he had all the tools necessary. So when he asked me that, yeah, this is Broward, bro. Yeah. <laughs> there's a there's someone yelling aggressively. Yeah, there's a disturbance. It's just getting yeah. aggressive. Yeah. You missed the guy, you know, saying what's up to to us in, in the window, by the okay. way, just recently. Right. But they always say what's up. Um, no, so like. I, I just basically said, like, as far as strength training goes, right, to build strength, to build armor, right, you need to do that. And you need to build it from a general perspective that can enhance the specific skills that you already have attained over the years, especially at his level, right? He's, he's been boxing for, I think he said, like, 20 years or yeah, something like that. Stupid, yeah. So I was like, 04 Olympian, yeah. Yeah, bro. Like, you don't, Jesus, 04? 04. He's 38 years old. Yeah, you yeah, know yeah. what I'm saying? And then you, you talk about, okay, he's also boxing since he was a kid. So, you know, I wanted to make sure that we were giving them the tools, right, from a, from, a, from a physicality perspective. And then on top of that, what does that do from a mental perspective? It gives you confidence because now I'm more physically stronger. So then when I go on the mats or I go in the cage or I go in the ring, I know that I have the skills because I do that every day. And now I have the physical capabilities to withstand blows, right, forces that have come upon me and the force that I can produce out. All right, if you can give me a, when you're behind the scenes, you get invested, you're a teacher, you're a coach, all that. Has there been a high profile victory that you worked on that you're like, I know, I know what was put in that camp. I was a part of it. Yeah. And, and you retain that pride for your student. Is there one that stands out? Uh, Dustin Poirier winning the, the interim world title against Max Holloway. You were there that night. UFC 236. Were you in Atlanta, Atlanta that night? No, I wasn't. I was at home because I think we had another another fighter fighting the weekend after, so I had to stay back. And I jumped up like I was there, and I think I woke up everybody in my household. Like, I lost my voice, everything, because I knew that this was something that was really something he wanted to do and wanted to achieve, and it was great. That was a tough fight, too, man. It was, man, and it was, <laughs> it was entertaining. But, for, like, I never really got uncomfortable watching him fight. And that's weird, because, you know, as, as, a, as a coach, I'm always like, I don't know, you know what I mean? Like, I know that they can do it, but you're not in there with them. This fight particularly, I was like, he's got it. He's like, he's got it. And, you know, obviously other fights, bigger fights in, in that way, I was kind of like, damn, this is a tough one, but I, you know, I got all faith in my man. But at the end of the day, this one, I was like, he's got it, for sure. All right, Luke, when you look at him, uh, this, you know, we use that term a lot that you invented, UBL, yeah. uh, upper bound limits. Looking at Phil DeRue in relation to us, we see, even though it's 10 years They look like different species. Some yeah. of the upper no, bound limits no, no, if we no, no. either, if I could get going on a 2013 Vitor plan, like, yeah. you know, all right. But here's the point. <laughs> when you look at his beard, though, that's Shout out to also, Vitor, by the way. <laughs> that's also what you could be if you took a little bit more attention, you dyed it, you grew it out, you quaffed it. How much maintenance is involved is that, in that? Because that's that fantastic. On the beard? Um, I've always had a beard, man. I've always had it. I think, you know, you have it's gotten to, thicker over the years, though, yeah? It, I think. Well, I, I took, I understand I take care of it more. You know, you condition it. Right. Kimbo always said, you take care of your beard, your beard takes care of you. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Yo, I know what he was referring to. I do, yeah. I mean, I've heard people have done He, he that. may have yeah, been a bodyguard yeah. on porn sites. Yeah. I, don't, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm just saying. That guy. Yeah, no, nah, man. Shout out to Kimbo. Well, while man, we can be peace. impressed with Coach here. I, Hold on, I, I, do, think, I do have one more on the serious angle, if I may. I don't do serious. Okay, never mind. Go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. If I may, if I may, I'm going to ask it this way. I'm not going to ask how much could strength and conditioning prevent injuries among MMA fighters? But what I will ask is, what role can it play? What role can it do? Because it seems like your guys, once they're in that program for a while, they just, well, in the fights, they're rough and tumble. But yeah, yeah, they seem understand. to always be able to make it without too much issue. I mean, it's reducing the risk of non-contact injuries. You know, you can't, obviously, you know, somebody 
you know, kicks a knee or something like that. What can you do? You can't do much. But when it comes to non-contact injuries, we want to negate that totally, right? Especially in camp when things get rougher, you know, um, intensities go up, reducing of, of calorie intake, you know, all those things come into play. We like to make sure that we get a full-on assessment in the beginning. I want to see bone mineral density. I want to see, you know, how, how low are they in body fat percentage wow. at that particular time, like usually around eight or nine weeks. And that's when I'll go and take them to the lab and get a DEXA scan done because that's pretty much the gold standard. And I'll, and I'll measure all that out and then we'll get dietary needs based upon that. If I, have my, if I had my full go, like if I had full control, that's what I would do. Right. And then from there, you know, it's figuring out what's their compensation patterns, where, where are they deficient at, where are their asymmetries. And you'll find that, you know, if somebody's just too much on one side of the body or isn't really rotating appropriately or you know has compensation patterns inside of a joint and doesn't have the capacity to do things we want to gain more capacity we want to gain more control we want to build more base and that's how you can reduce the risk of that non-contact injury dr bam bam could fix my liver in probably like three weeks all right i need him to fix my shoulder and also the way i look um, i need that oh, good, look man. you can't see a man this tatted it up without talking about it and this yeah, I and it. i don't know a ton about the you know the history of it like you do but that's impressing me he's too. paid some money for these you know? yeah yeah I, and i got more since we talked man you got a you got a guy you go to yeah he's actually in pompano yeah i went to high school actually I, I played little league football with him yeah so he's gotten he's done all my stuff and we're still going we're going all the way up as you've seen my my guy jake boswick i gotta ca- try to catch up to him yeah i mean that's not a job you can i mean that's, i mean <laughs> it's a lifestyle like if it. someone asked him what do you do for a living oh i fight bare knuckle right yeah. It works out. But you would never be like attorney, you know what I mean? <laughs> no. Accountant. Not at this point. Set some carnival over. rides on the weekends. No, he's too, he's, too, he's too big and strong for that. He, but he, very friendly too, by the way, I, I might add. He's, he's a nice guy. He's a nice guy. Super so, charismatic. So yeah. you got into this whole bit where like you're coaching coaches. What, what does that mean? Yeah, so the coaches that, the trainers that work with fighters or work with athletes or just general pop clients that want to learn some of the methods that I've been able to put together I coach them. So now I put together a mentorship program that I can coach any trainer from around the world. So we have over 5,000 coaches in the mentorship program um, from anywhere from like, you know, Italy to Australia to the U.S. to Canada. And the great thing there is that not only am I able to help them, but I'm helping them help all the other athletes that they work with. So now I can spread out my methods. I can spread out the service that I've been able to give to the people that work with me directly, and I can do that in a wider range. Are these coaches like specific to combat sports, or they tend to be whatever? Yeah, anything, really. If, you're, if you love the methods, if you love the systems that I use, and, and the systems can be spread around any area. I still use condensed conjugate for my, for my general pop clients because it is versatile. It's just a skeleton system. And then from there, you plug and paste, and I give them certain protocols and things of that nature. In training ideologies to a degree, I'm not a big ideology guy. I'm not a big guy. Like, I'm not a huge proponent of, like, living in one world. I, I do like to take things from every other person that I feel is appropriate or, you know, different methods. Josh Fabia included? Definitely not. Uh, <laughs> definitely not. I was about to say, who is that? <laughs> that would have been better. <laughs> the Diego's old guy. Nah, like, bro, there's, uh, there's certain things that just doesn't make sense. But, you know. And when it comes down to it, it's like fundamental movement patterns, understanding fatigue management, you know, understanding uh, communication and then putting it all together in a systemized approach that can progress an athlete and also reduce the risk of non-contact injury. That's the that's That's the main point. Strong right there, bro. That's it. I'm looking at this equipment. I'm so fucking jealous of your equipment, man. Man, we was going to train, man. What happened? I uh, I flew to the wrong airport. (laughs) (laughs) That is what happened. That's a that's a true thing. Watch this. Ready for this, BC? Tell me if I say anything wrong. So the back extension there, the ghost machine, here's why that one's special, because you've got the back tray on it, which means with the bands on the bottom, which means not only can you do barbell raises up the bottom for your posterior chain, but you can now attach bands to it as well. The one I have at home does not have that capability. This one allows you to go Pete Rubish super heavy on the back end. Yes, that's heavy. Yeah. Pete Rubish heavy. That's yeah. pretty nerd heavy right there. That, um, there's, your, there's your deadlift jack. I have well, the exact what, we call, what do we call band tension at an end range? Oh, I don't know. I don't do bands very much. So bands at an end range gives you accommodated resistance. Accommodated resistance. That's it. Phil, can I ask you a key question? I want to get on about... that seal row before we go. Okay, yeah. yeah. Well, you, you I've, never, I've never used the seal what row. What about the reverse hypers? I have a reverse hyper. Okay, good. Can I ask you key questions about gym culture, but I want you to be dead honest with me, okay? Sure. 
Lifting gloves, yay or nay? No way. Yes! No way. Fuck you! No Fuck way. you! I look like the president of... Eat shit! No eat shit! Eat shit! Yeah, do you, do you wear with the fingers out? Do you do the fingers out with it? I don't, I don't use that. I haven't used them since high school. Oh, but, please, good. You know, but I, if it's I, good enough for Ronnie Coleman... Phil, Phil, listen. In, I, in GSP, it's Phil, good enough for me. Listen, right? listen. I'm 43, okay? Yeah. It looks like I've been hit by a bus <laughs> and they threw lard on me. That's what I look like. I look terrible. But there was once upon a time... I lived in the gym. These fuckers don't believe anything I say. All right, back to my line of no, 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 hold on, Phil. True I respect. I respect his knowledge. Bro, you go into oh, any. It's very book heavy. Uh, you go, dude. In the Marine Corps gym, this was definitely true. You walk into any gym, filled with dudes like this, you're just running. And you trains. put on the gloves. You're just running trains. I've I've heard these stories. All right, just you know. <laughs> damn. Took it damn. God, <laughs> sorry, took it damn. sorry about that. They're gonna throw you out the fucking yeah, window. Yeah, yeah, they will. Yeah. No, uh, I had a had a I had a SWAT officer try to put these things on and I grabbed them like mid like pull down. I was like, get the fuck They're out of here. They're condoms for your hands. All right, yeah. back, back to gym culture. What about people that have me ways and means? They even have the hopes and dreams, yet they're still working out in their front yard. How, like, just homeless bullshit is that, you know As I mean? far as what, though? What are they trying to They're doing, like, he's full take, He's on, taking a shot at me, but he's wrong. You know, instead of, like, working out in his basement, Luke goes out in the front yard and watches. I did, I did for a long time. And just flaunts that it's shit. It's going to sound like I'm fully with him, but I'm not You're mad not. at that. I'm no, not come mad on. I'm not mad at that. No, I'm no, not no, mad I've, at that. I've mostly... Get I've, it in where you can, man. Like This was during the pandemic, when the gyms were open, they were closed, they were open, they were closed. This was, you know, I don't know what was in Florida, but certainly most of the country was. So I just started investing in my home gym and during covid it was like dude it wasn't unusual you know depending again florida didn't have the same kind of lockdowns but you know, it was a while in dc where you couldn't even leave your fucking house or whatever so we were just i was just ordering shit and having it sent and then i had enough i was like i got a little set here you know yeah, that's a little class but now my shoulder's all jacked up so i'm using kettlebells <laughs> that's what you were telling me we, yeah. we got some kettlebell stuff that we can do i'll show you how and finally go. about gym culture how do you make sense of or understand that I can walk into most gyms, fitness centers, see almost no old guys in there, but if I go in the men's restroom, there's just balls hanging that's, out. That's it's going, like man. a party, it's like that's balls bonanza. What you up gotta go that, in the sauna bro. first, cause they're butt naked in the sauna primarily, right? Then maybe the steam room, right? They're brushing teeth and shaving yeah. with, with just Dude, old men. Old, old men will, yeah, old men will literally put on socks and shoes before underwear. <laughs> <laughs> that's very true. They don't do that's that at Drew Strong. Nah, I, don't think I, I left the gym after that one. I was good. Yeah. I, I never went back. When that What's one. the number one benefit? I guess the number one benefit of owning your own gym is what? Like you can just work out whenever the fuck you want. Yeah, you can. I mean, I use this is my lab. You know, right. I, this isn't like to the public or anything. No, like no, this is private. Um, but yeah, even I, when I started the gym, I just got sick. When I, I started at a at a real competitive powerlifting gym when I was fighting too as well. So I never really did the Gold's Gym LA Fitness. I would go here and there, but I grew up in a powerlifting strongman environment as far they as They call my, that a judgment full zone. Yeah, yeah. only yeah. judgment zone. Like you couldn't touch the radio unless you squatted over 400, 450 pounds and bench at least 300 pounds, right? You didn't touch the radio. And so with that, there was no gloves by the way either. <laughs> Um, <laughs> like couldn't do that either. And, and so for me, I was like, I wanted to get, I wanted to keep that environment going. And I said, well, if I have the means to do so, I'll just create my own environment and make sure that the culture is what I want it to be. And so that's what I do. Fair enough. Do you feel like, in all seriousness, do you feel like, okay, okay it's kind of funny, right? Like when I look around, I'm like, who else is doing what Phil does? And of course you're pretty unique, but there are other people trying to do certain kinds of things. Like he moved on, but for a while, Bo Sandoval was at, um, at UFC PI. But funnily enough, where did he come from? Football, right? It, to what extent is that some kind of influence in how you think about your facility, how to train, everything? We still have high school football guys that come in here. We actually, I have to have some NFL, 15 NFL guys coming in on um, Wednesday, this Wednesday. But yeah, it's, it, it's because of the fact that Football was our first understanding of how to do strength and conditioning as a, from a sport perspective, right? That was the first sport that actually really adopted strength and conditioning. And then, you know, other sports came along, hockey and, and, and even like basketball and baseball. They didn't come till later, but football was that sport. So you have a lot of guys that one, it was one of those things where you wanted to get bigger, stronger, faster. So how do you get bigger, stronger, faster? Well, you do that in the weight room. Right. And you need to get bigger, stronger, faster for football because football is a very, you know, high impact sport. Right. And so for that, I think that that's why a lot of those guys kind of migrate over to other sports and they have the understanding of it because they have 
a background in basic biomechanics and physiology and so on and so forth. All right, who's been like, you know, you just test them, you see them work out, and you're just like, this guy's a fucking freak. The one that just left. Boswick? Jake, 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 ba Jake Boswick has been with me for seven years, and I would tell you right now, the kid puts in so much work and effort, and I have another one, there's two, and they go hand in hand. It's like they kind of, they compete all the time. It's him and Tyler Ray, who works out of, uh, works out of Kill Cliff now, I'm gonna call it Kill Cliff. But these two guys, they're not the, the biggest names, but they put in the most work. Right. And then another guy that's outside of that, Timberland. Timberland. Boy, I've seen his transformation. Man, I'm going to tell mean you. mean like Timberland and Magoo? Yes. yes. Tim. From Virginia Beach, Timberland. Uh, when did, so walk me through that. You're going through your day and you get a phone call or however it happened. So, yeah. So it's funny because Jake actually did pad work with him. So he's been doing pad work with, with Timberland for like five, six years. And then one day, Tim you know, told Jake, he's like, man, who's the trainer that you work with? I want to work with him. So Jake actually called me and goes, Tim wants to work with you. Come, come to the house. So I was like, cool. Went to the house. I, for the first year, I saw that he had no movement in, in his hips. He had very little movement in his upper back. So we had him on the floor doing mobility work and just basic biomechanics for the f entire year. And so that he bought into that system. And then from there, we started to grow into, okay, now he's standing up. Now he's doing more dynamic movements. And he built a great base with David Alexander. The, one of the guys, I don't know if you guys know who that is. He's, a, he's another great strength and conditioning coach, worked with LeBron and, and D Wade and all those guys down in Miami. Built a good base with him. And then for me, I just took it and just try to run with it as much as possible and started to progress him going further. Now I won't say names because you may have had to sign an NDA, but you got a celebrity clientele that's impressive, almost like, man, maybe that's the pivot. I mean, that's, that could be a fun, a fun life Seriously, for the rest Seriously, of your life. How, could you live off of just training Timbaland alone? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. You, know, you know what, Phil? Fuck you. Absolutely. Fuck. Well, well absolutely. I, w I want to give you the chance to answer this. Uh, what's that like? You know, it's one thing to train, ex you know, Olympian, NFL, or mixed martial artists, mm -hmm. or bare knuckle fighter. But what's it like training? Athletically like? ordinary. Because yeah. these these movie stars, they're they're yoked as shit. But you know, yeah. did they put in the work to get that? That's my question. I mean, I know I know The Rock puts in crazy amount of work. I know Kevin Hart puts in a crazy amount of work. And this is, I'm just saying that I don't train them. Don't don't say that I train them. But I know the guys that do. And I know you know them as as individuals. They're the hardest workers in the room wherever they go. Right. But Tim is the same person. He's the same way. I put him with some of my elite fighters. He trains with Jake sometimes. He trains with Tyler sometimes. I've seen that, yeah, yeah. You've seen it. And he may not be able to do most of the, the actual, you know, exercises or, or anything like that, but he'll still put in the effort, which is important. And I've noticed with the most elite people, they, they're that, that common theme of effort is solely there. Right, he may be athletically ordinary, but in no other way is he ordinary. What he's trying to say is that Marky Mark does so much shit before you even think about waking up each morning. <laughs> yeah, it's not chicken and broccoli that got him those abs. Let's just be very, well, maybe it helps, but I'm sure, I'm, listen, all those guys in Hollywood, who's the guy who plays Thor, like Hemsworth or whatever his first, I, I, my, my wife has a crush on that dude. And I was, she was like, he lives so many weights. And I'm like, he does. <laughs> Are you doing Gringo Poppy Bay right now? Is this what's going on? No, else? my wife's from South America, but I was like, I was like, yes, he does lift weights. He also lifts SARMs and uh, TRT and uh, out there, yeah, yeah. you know, I'm not, I'm not hating on. They, it. I'm every, just saying, they do have anything at the and everything at the. I just try to explain to people there's a certain kind of realistic perspective you have to have. If you, sure. even if you work your ass off, yeah, yeah, there's a level that you're gonna level out at, and it doesn't look like Thor. Just yeah, you, that you have a genetic makeup at a genetic ceiling per se. You know that you have to hit and that. That's that's what it is, but you can always push it to the actual ceiling of where that is. So so where where where's Phil Derue headed, man? Man, I'm, since, since we talked I'm the first time, to, you've been like a completely different person in certain ways. You I know? appreciate. It. I'm trying to do it all, man. Honestly, you know, I just want to put the people in the right place to do it. You know, I'm trying to build a a solid team with everybody that I have here, and then scale it. You know, not only not only for this gym, but for gyms to come. You know, I want to do a licensing where I'm licensing out the methods to all gyms in the world that. One, maybe the mentorees that I, that I coach that have gyms, they can use those methods. And as we license that, then we can start to do more continuing education on that front, put together a university or a course that is a CEU for any nationally accredited certification. That's gonna help my guys still stay relevant in their certifications. Then on top of that, you know, I wanna, I wanna build something with Tim. We got something big with Pushing Peaks, which is a program that we have out, but it's really more so about optimizing human performance from a whole. 
And I want to build that up into something spectacular, maybe do conferences down the line and then also maybe a sports club. So there's a lot there. I, I can go on. Just and don't on sell it. out if they're like, we want you to be the official gym of power slap. Be like. So uh, I'm going to I had a couple. Of I'll just say this. This is just a personal that. thing for me. Phil, I just want to tell you this on camera. Listen, anyone who makes it from any walk of life, I have respect for. Right. And I feel like you're not you're not done. But I do feel like you've made something for yourself pretty pretty special. I especially appreciate it out of the, the blue collar guys who don't have shit handed to them. And you didn't just do it with hard work. You did it with constant adult learning, making good decisions, betting on yourself, investing in yourself. You've never been short on that. And I've kind of watched it from afar and I've been like, yeah, I don't think your success is in any way accidental, bro. It's not. I, mean, I appreciate that, really. Coming from you guys, I, th I thank you so much, man, because it really is a constant, constant, like, progression and, and, and grind to a, to a degree. Like, I don't stop. It doesn't stop. And, and it's, I'm grateful and blessed to have the family that I have that understand that. You know, my wife is phenomenal. She knows that I'm up at 11, 12, 1 o'clock at night still studying, still putting together, you know, plans and programs and formulating new processes so that we can grow and do things that... I always saw myself doing, right? Traveling the world, helping people, um, and accomplishing many things to come, and then building something of that, right? Building, quote unquote, a legacy, but really it's just what I can pass down to the people that follow me. Are, where does your vision for yourself come from? And when I say vision, I don't mean like that thing. I mean thinking of yourself as someone who is capable of doing things because honestly man like that's not necessarily inherent it's certainly not intuitive a lot of people grow up thinking why would i even bother i can't be anything and you had every reason to not think that at least for a certain part of your life but yet you never really seem to you always seem to be like oh i this will always go well yeah it's, it's interesting you asked me that because i thought about that last night and i was like it really, literally last night and i go i've never had doubt in myself like i've always been like strategic we're like okay be smart, like it's gonna take time. And getting older, I'm a lot more patient in my approach, where I'm a little bit more you know, strategy based. For the most part, when I was younger, it was like, just go after it, get it done. And in your 20s, you can kind of do that. When you get to your 30s, and, and, and we'll see in my 40s, and the great thing is I have people that are at that level in their 40s and 50s like yourself, that I can go oh, to. See that? Yeah, I did that. <laughs> that I could go to ask for advice on, like, what did you feel at this particular time in your life? What did you feel at this particular time? And I'll never forget. Um, so Tim is now like a mentor to me, too, as well. Not only that, he's a business partner. But for me, I asked him, I go, you know, he goes, he actually said, I love your. And the reason why he stuck with me is because he loves my my grind, my effort, the, the, the stuff that I put in. He goes, man, he's like, just keep working. He's like, be strategic. Be conscious of your thoughts, understand what you're doing, but know that you have to be patient. And his mentor told him, and his mentor is a big name, I'm not gonna say the name, but he's a big name, um, told him, you're not gonna make your real money, just be patient, because you're not gonna make your real money until you're 50, because that's when everything comes together. Peak earning years, yep. That's what they say. I mean, whatever that means, I just took it as just be patient and it's gonna come and don't look at anybody else and try to dictate what you're doing or feel bad about what you're doing or where you're at because you look at somebody else at a higher level. Yeah, run your own race, motherfucker. Exactly, that was good, I like that. We should put that on shirts. Yeah. <laughs> so do you see a world where you might just like not train MMA fighters anymore? Yeah, no, I definitely do. I, I, I'm at that point now where like I have my guys, I don't wanna take on any new clients to that degree. Um, I have my personal training clients, I have my online clients, I have my fighters, but I'm not interested right now unless it's something that really, it's like Dustin says, like you gotta get me out of bed, you know, in that, in that particular way, I always will help somebody, but I'm gonna give them to my coaches that I coach now. So now those young guys coming up, whether they be in the UFC, Bellator, 1FC, whatever, if they come to the gym, I'm gonna say go to you know, go to K, go to Jack. These are my young kids that are actually coming up in the game. So I want them to get the experience. I want them to get what I got. So that's where I'm at right now. That's where I'm headed. Uh, well, Phil, I have, over the years, man, I will just tell you that, like, I have all, it's funny, right? I've been, I have always been, or not always, but every time there's a new wrinkle, I'm like, huh, look at Phil trying something new, doing this. Like there's new little wrinkles every time. I have to learn to stop being, I guess I am, I'm, not, I'm no longer surprised, but you do find ways to grow and reinvent and self 
again, uh, bettering yourself in ways that is just so, um, not just unusual, but proof of concept. It all, mostly anyway, that seemed to work for you. And I have to say this, because you, you gave me a spotlight when nobody did. You started me out in this world. I always say that. I always, you know, have gratitude towards you and what you've done for me. So I thank you once again for putting me out there and letting okay. me do what I think. Take nothing of it. It's funny. Do you, know, do you remember what you asked me when I called you on the phone? Oh, no. You go, uh, why are you, do you want to talk to me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, we walked through it, and in the end, it came out just fine. But I remember you being like, why do you want to talk to me? And I was yeah, like, because yeah, yeah. I think this might be interesting. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Yeah. So, I think yeah. at that point, I was kind of like, what's going on here? You know? And so, and I'm still very selfless. So I'm like, why are you talking to me? You're, you're an MMA journalist to a degree, right? We're combat sport journalists now. You're entertainers. We've evolved to entertainers. Hundred percent. Like you, I, you, I, you've I, evolved. You've evolved tremendously. Yeah. And, and I you, prefer you the term in that hat. Thank you. I'm gonna say that. I prefer the term pornographer. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. And I've always watched your breakdowns and everything. And it, and you come at that, at that way, and like in that way, the same way I come at physical preparation. So Angry. that's where. Yeah. To a degree. Yeah, <laughs> to a degree. yeah fair. Yeah, I see uh, but less, less sad, perhaps. Less sad and depressed. Uh, well, Phil, thank you for bringing us in here, man. Thank you, man. Uh, I guess if folks want to get in touch with you, and I, I actually don't know, who is the right person for Phil DeRue? Like, who would I send your way? Uh, it seems like you cast a pretty wide net. Sure. Yeah, I mean, well, if you were to go to any of my social media accounts, you can get me there. DeRue Strong, at DeRue Strong, and then I have my accounts for the gym and, and education space, and then my website is DeRueStrong.com. My Twitter is at DeRue Strong. My, if you want to find out more, like, videos and stuff, it's Phil DeRue on YouTube. I get all, all that stuff on there. But if you want to contact me directly, you can contact my assistant, Maureen Shea. She's a two-time world champion boxer, so don't, hey. don't, don't, uh, don't get slick out the mouth. Yeah. <laughs> she, she trained the million-dollar baby for the film. She, she, she yeah. looks the part, man. She looks uh, it was great meeting her. Luckily, I didn't tell her my review of the film. It just goes off a cliff, dude. I mean, I know it won a lot of awards. No one prepared me at all for it that. It gets right? sad. Yeah, it gets yeah, sad at the end. Alert. Luckily, yeah. she did no writing on the film. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fair enough. Right, but at Maureen, or actually, it's, it's Maureen at DeRueStrong.com. There you go. All he does is build champions. Build champions. Built himself. Built a business. Built champions. And uh, not imagine, done yet. imagine this artist could take an, an unfinished work like this, like this dad bod, and give him about give him about three to six I weeks. Need, I need to move to know? Florida and see what happens yeah. to my life. I honestly feel like I'd be I'd look completely different. No, absolutely. Uh, I would I would let you inject with me with the effort you put in. Absolutely, uh, for sure. I, I, well, you know, Phil, I'm pretty pathetic these days, but <laughs> I try. I try. Uh, I, I'd like to get a saggy nipple like most good champions these days. Smoke weed. I hear that's what you got to do. Smoke weed. All right, there, you go. All right. there, you go. there he is, Phil Derue. That's Brian Campbell. I'm Luke Thomas. Morning comment. Room service diaries.